Riot Games, Naughty Dog, Rockstar, Bethesda, Gearbox. All studios renowned in gaming all have created some of the most successful games and franchises of all time, and are all owned by someone else. The shape of the industry has changed. The leaders aren't the best developers, but the shrewdest business people, those willing to embrace, extend, and extinguish. It's not as though these developers have been completely swallowed up, however, and in many cases, they remain autonomous entities functioning in their own means. But follow the parent company chain long enough, and you'll find most studios you know and love will be wholly, or partly, owned by one of a handful of gaming goliaths. These giants, Microsoft, Sony, T2, Embracer, EA, Tencent, have majority and minority stakes in dozens of studios, making them formidable names in the gaming landscape. Other companies like Nintendo or Ubisoft have made their way to where they are today through cornering off pockets of the market or turning independent studios into their own satellite offices. Although their methods may differ, their outcome is consistent. These companies are nothing short of verifiable gaming empires. So, where do we go from here? Do these titans keep battling it out and buying each other until one remains in a business slash expansionist battle royale? Or have the figureheads been set and will remain seated at the same table, plotting each other's demise like a meeting of mafia patriarchs? The future may be uncertain, but what we're more interested in is how this affects us, the consumer, and how we even got here in the first place. To really get an idea of how these companies got to this point, let's take a look at a studio we can all get behind, Bandai Namco, publishers of household names like Pac-Man, Tekken, and Dark Souls. Despite having a repertoire of big franchises under their belt, the company was only formed in 2005. Previously, you had Namco, the game developer, and Bandai, the toy manufacturer. Both were pretty huge companies in their own right. Namco had grown to become a well-respected Japanese developer, and Bandai was one of the top toy manufacturers worldwide. Yet despite their size and status, they were worried that in a world of increasing technological advancement from other Japanese companies, they would be individually left at the wayside. So, the companies merged, and with their combined portfolios, they established a reach far greater than their individual influences ever could, and the ability to take on and create products far beyond their initial scope, which is, for us the consumer, only a good thing, surely. Fast forward to now and Bandai Namco is one of the highest revenue earning game companies around and remains as one of the most profitable toy manufacturers in the world. So being the best at what you do simply isn't enough. There has been a lot of boardroom politics taking the biggest companies to where they are today. But it's not just a quick overnight fusion or rapid takeover job. Most of these companies got where they are through a painstaking cruel of acquisitions that lasted decades. Look at Ubisoft, creators of Rainbow Six, Assassin's Creed, and most importantly to their success, Rayman. Back in the 80s, they had a similar start to most video game companies. They started small, founded by the five Guillermo brothers. They started out simply distributing games before they opted to dip their toes in the world of video game production. It was all pretty humble trading back and forth until they hit it big with Rayman on the PlayStation 1. There was a huge gap in the market for a solid mascot on this young console. Ubisoft seized their opportunity, and it paid off handsomely. Following this success, they raised over $80 million in funds, which allowed for some ambitious, albeit risky, expansions. They opened four new offices around the world, turning themselves from a tiny little French game dev into a global publicly traded enterprise, albeit a small one. But over the next few decades, they grew into one of the major players. But not just in making games, they would produce the games, publish them, and distribute them themselves on their own dedicated storefront away from their competitors. Every possible middleman was removed, and every step from initial spark to having the game in the customer's hands was sold internally. But that's just smart business, right? Well. Their idea to distribute their games through their own shop is something that nearly all of the other big players do these days. Sony has the PS Store, Microsoft has its Xbox Store app, there's the Epic Games Store, Steam, Origin, the eShop, etc, etc. 
There's an undeniable reason why these companies want their own stores, and it's nothing to do with keeping things consistent or staying on brand. Imagine you own a shop that sells this box. There's probably going to be a bunch of other stores that sell a similar, if not identical, box. So, you're going to have to lower your prices in line with your competitors if you want the box to steadily sell. Now, if you were the only one who sold the box, well, then you could charge whatever you wanted. Well, within reason. No one's going to remortgage their home for a box, but you can sell it at a premium price. Now think of Nintendo. Their consoles have only one store on them, the eShop, and the digital versions of their games are only available on that console and on that shop. They can dictate the price. In most cases, they will keep their games at their debut price until they become obsolete. That's one way to build a gaming empire, by cornering and cutting off your section of the market. But the opposite also works. Valve, as a game developer, are pretty small. Sure, we all love Half-Life, and Dota and CS will remain as esports staples for many a year to come, but that's not where the money comes from. Valve's big ticket item is its distribution storefront, Steam. It's a go-to for PC purchases, and within a decade of its launch, it held a 75% market share over digital game distribution. The vast majority of the 50,000-strong library are from developers and publishers of all shapes and sizes. Sure, Valve gets a share of each game's sale, but because most of these games are available elsewhere, they opt to be competitive, and offer games at a lower price than you typically find on other distribution platforms, which attracts users. A whole lot of them. A huge audience and a gigantic library of available titles makes the platform a competitive market of sorts, more so than Nintendo's self-regulated version, and provides a clear passage for smaller developers to get their game in front of an audience, without the rigmarole of publishing contracts or physical game distribution. So, due to all the ways these companies have grown and expanded, we have a bunch of different storefronts of limited availability between each. Any PC user looking for the best deal will know the struggle of booting up and being hit with half a dozen game launches. The cost of searching around for the best deal is having to skip between all these different storefronts, so most users simply don't. Think about groceries. Do you split your shopping by going to a handful of different shops, or do you go to the one that's the most convenient? It gets a bit more complicated than just shopping for the best price, however, as competition and profit start to be taken into account. Why would EA want to give Valve a 30% cut of their profits for having their titles on Steam, rather than just making their own shop and maximizing their revenue? Which is what EA did back in 2011, before returning to Steam a decade later, with new stringent measures in place. However, the options are there, and each portal isn't just a place to buy games. Each company has souped up their software, providing as much functionality as possible to the consumer. Game overlays, social features, customizable profiles, achievements, voice chat, automatic updates. They are all constantly evolving and transforming to offer the best experience for the user, which is great for us, right? All these improvements have come about because of competition, as each of these companies strive to be the top dog. To be the best, you have to have the best people and the best technology. Rather than each competing for the same developers, the same artists, creators, and innovators, why not just look at the studio that allowed them to blossom and buy them out? This bundle buying, if you will, has been the go-to of gaming giants for years. At first glance, it's a perfect scenario. The parent company gets to push out higher caliber games, while the studio gets additional resources to create their dream titles. Furthermore, the consumers get a renewed interest in their favorite games, with products created more frequently. More abundant, high-quality games flood into the stores, making a competitive market, and lo and behold, the choice is mind-boggling. But the companies aren't satisfied simply with games. There's also the ongoing console war, with Sony and Microsoft going toe-to-toe -to, -toe to offer the most powerful, advanced, and intuitive home console a constant back and forth to make their flagship piece of hardware the best on the market. The expansions don't stop at studios. Technology, cloud services, gaming on demand. We're being provided with options that cut out the process of installing and updating, and in some cases, even buying games. Take Xbox's Game Pass. We can boil it down to declare it simply as a Netflix for games. One low monthly fee gives you a vast catalog of games from Microsoft's many subsidiaries. And as Microsoft grew, 
and brought in even more studios under their belt, bigger deals were made, and more showstopper titles would be added to this repertoire. Once Bethesda and Blizzard came under their influence, consumers got the likes of The Elder Scrolls, Overwatch, Fallout, Call of Duty, Warcraft, and Diablo, each billion-dollar franchises in their own right. Combined with Microsoft's other acquisitions and push into cloud gaming advancements, we could realistically have a service that allows us to pick up and play games in an instant, a rival to any video streaming software and unheard of in gaming previously. Even Google failed when trying to take on that task with Stadia. But then again, they didn't have an empire of gaming subsidiaries already under their belt. It's something that could change the landscape of gaming, but Microsoft aren't the only ones that can do it. Any one of the gaming giants have the capital and resources to change the industry for the better. And if the way they formed into slick, well-oiled machines pumping out titles into a competitive market almost seems too good to believe, well, that's because it is. The truth is, these companies aren't competing for your love and loyalty. They're competing for your money. And the bigger cut of a market share they can slice off, the better for them. Microsoft, Sony, Tencent, Nintendo, Embracer, EA, T2, Valve, and Ubisoft may all seem too big to fail now, but vast enterprises and industries have crumbled before. In fact, we were in a similar situation to this nearly 100 years ago. Back in the golden age of cinema, the world was getting swept up in a fresh form of exciting mass media and entertainment. The fledgling, so-called film industry, quickly cemented when a few organized studios rapidly worked out the means to produce frequent pictures en masse and deliver them to the public. There were eight players controlling 95% of the American film market, and out of those eight, five in particular took the lion's share. Known as the Five Majors, their success wasn't down to the way they made their movies or even the quality, but because they were in control of every link in the chain. From development to production, through marketing, distribution, and exhibition, everything was controlled by the studio, and no profits were being dropped through middlemen along the way. The key to their success, however, was that they controlled the cinemas. They decided what was shown and had a clear route to get each of their many, many films in front of the masses. This structure of a company is called vertical integration. No step is outsourced and no outside help is needed. It doesn't sound all that radical by this point because we've been talking about it all this time. Let's look back to Sony. Within their company, they handle the production of the games, they market them themselves, publish themselves, distribute and exhibit on their own storefront on a platform that they own, and have the rights to restrict their competitors and push their own products. Starting to see the parallels now? So, why are we even making this comparison? Because these major film studios didn't stop doing this because it proved to be ineffective, quite the opposite. It was massively successful and allowed them to have a stranglehold on the market, so much so that any potential competition would either be forced out of business or absorbed into one of these empires. The studios had all the power until the court stepped in and shut it down. See, when just a few people hold all the power, it's great for them, but not so much for everyone else. Their practices were deemed as manipulative and unfair and the antitrust suits brought before the studios required them to sell off their cinema chains, cutting the head off of each operation. Although there were a few different studios running the show, it became apparent to the courts that things could quickly get out of hand, and if one player in the industry became increasingly cutthroat, there could see a rise of a film monopoly. You'll see the term monopoly thrown around quite a lot when looking at various multi-billion dollar industries, but what that term actually means is quite important here. A monopoly is essentially characterized by one company running the show. There is no competition, no substitutes, and said company can essentially do whatever they want with the market. In fact, the eponymous board game does a pretty good job of showing how a monopoly works. A once competitive market devolves until only one person is having fun, everyone else is powerless to them, and no amount of table flipping, cursing, or pleading can lead you away from the fact that you have lost, and there is nothing you can do about it. So yeah, they're not great, and it's no surprise that courts want to take preventative measures to avoid an industry getting to that stage. On the other hand, 
there's an oligopoly where a few large firms rise to the top of the market buying out or forcing their competitors out of business until only a few huge companies remain controlling their own partitions of one market so this is where the five major studios ended up and fast forward a hundred years and it's where we are now with the video game industry but you may say times have changed the video game industry is different it's all under control and the consumer benefits more today than they did during the reign of the five major film studios but is that really true we're seeing several key factors and similarities between then and now the studios between them would make around 360 films per year which is a huge amount for the consumer to take in but the market was saturated there was too much choice and in between the few standout pictures most were rushed poorly thought out and made just to keep a schedule of releases sound familiar it was a market that was held completely under a stranglehold one that video game companies are emulating and even surpassing back then MGM's biggest hit and almost certainly one of the most iconic films of the era was Gone with the Wind. Gone with the Wind writes history, a new chapter in film triumphs. It grossed a staggering $200 million at the time, which, adjusted for inflation, puts it at nearly $4 billion today. Activision Blizzard alone makes $5 billion just from microtransactions in a single year. So the numbers have gotten bigger, the companies have become increasingly powerful. But the fact remains that the video game market is competitive and cannot go the way of the major five film studios. But again, how true is that really? In terms of a market, the ideal is a perfect competitive one, a huge number of sellers and a huge number of buyers. Due to the sheer scale and choice, no one firm can alter or sway the prices across the market. But we don't have that. Look at Nintendo. Through the success of their IPs and stringent copyright, they have created an environment where they are in full control of all the big titles on their hardware. They dictate the store's economy and they can drop the price of third-party games as they please. But the games that earn them the most, their own titles, will retain their price. And there isn't much any other company can do about it. Sony can't come along and make a Mario game. There are no real substitutions, so their slice of the market is locked down almost impenetrable. So we don't have monopolies in gaming, but we do have monopolistic competition. Sure, there are several competitors, but in many cases, their products aren't in true competition with each other. It's a bleak scene, and it does seem like history is repeating itself. But if the court stepped in against the practices of film studios, what are they doing here? Well, there are measures in place to some degree. In recent years especially, with studio purchasing getting more and more rampant, these deals are being watched. Microsoft famously made waves in the gaming landscape by buying one of the other gaming giants, Activision Blizzard, for an eye-watering $68 billion. But the thing is, that could all simply unravel. If the FTC, the American Federal Trade Commission, has reason to believe that Microsoft are making moves to directly attack their competitors or gain an unfair share of the market, the deal could fall apart, so all eyes are on Microsoft to not misstep. The burning question during the initial reports was will Microsoft make Active Blizzard's games Xbox exclusive? The same question that was thrown around when they acquired Bethesda. The case was made that they didn't want to shut out player bases, and maybe that was a truly selfless choice. But it could also be the case that they know they're stepping on eggshells, and one rash move could force the courts to intervene. We're always out there looking for people who we think would be a good match and teams that would be a good match with our strategy. So we're definitely not done. It's a very delicate line to toe and one that Microsoft have crossed before. Microsoft's pattern of extending a laurel branch and inviting other companies to join them or be forced out of business is nothing new. Revelations were made when investigators uncovered manipulative strategies in play by the company referred to internally as the EEE strategy. Embrace, extend, and extinguish. Their aggressive business play landed them in hot water, being hit with several antitrust suits in the EU, amounting to hundreds of millions of euros. The decision adopted today imposes a fine of 561 million euros on Microsoft for this very serious infringement. 
Yet these antitrust suits rarely touch gaming companies, partly down to the fact that there's a much bigger target in the public eye. Big Tech Yep, up against the likes of Amazon, Google, Apple, Microsoft and Meta, the biggest companies in gaming are, frankly, tiny. And whilst the gaming industry is growing at a staggering rate, it's still just targeting a small sect of the general public. Big tech companies have a direct impact on just about everyone in the Western world. So sure, the gaming market has been manipulatable, and we are seeing the rise of unstoppable global players. But the various Silicon Valley giants have the power to do so much more, change the way we think, tell us what we should buy. They can even dictate the course of politics. That's more power than any monopoly has ever had, and action is being taken. Apple has been hit with antitrust suits in Europe down to its monopolistic behavior and aggressive cut of apps and in-app purchases. Google has been under fire in the US, claiming their Play Store controls the Android app market and favors their software over their competitors. The FTC has their eye on Meta, with a case looking to pry acquisitions like Instagram and WhatsApp away from the social media titan. And Amazon has towns and cities lobbying to get them to build warehouses near them, offering them tax breaks and promising lucrative incentives. Remember Gone with the Wind, that era-defining film that grossed $4 billion? And then we learned that Activision Blizzard surpassed that in a year with microtransactions alone. Well, Amazon, make that in a week. Big Tech's power has gone far and above any other typical business to date, yet the companies controlling the gaming market are kind of just a micro version of them. They may not have the sway to hold a stake in geopolitical situations, but they can still divide and conquer a multi-billion dollar industry. It seems it's this stature that's allowing some of their practices to go under the radar. We've seen big moves from Microsoft in the past few years, but compared to Microsoft as a whole, as in computer and tech conglomerate Microsoft, the Xbox, the Game Pass, xCloud, all their acquisitions, Bethesda, Blizzard, is still just a tiny sliver of the company's whole ecosystem. Likewise with Sony, likewise with Tencent, they all have vast amounts of buying power from their parent companies and could disrupt the balance of the major players greatly. But it seems as though things are steady. Is this to not upset the balance or merely to keep their interests away from investigation? These are the kind of companies that if left unchecked would have the power to dictate not just the games we play or the way we play them, but multiple facets of the way we communicate, the way we spend, buy, socialize, engage, even think. How does this all look for us now? Gaming has become a complex web that all comes back to just a few sources. It's mind-boggling, sometimes shocking, oftentimes outrageous. The status quo is dug in deep, but is there a way to untangle the way things are or prevent these oligopolies from increasing their power? Probably not. History may be repeating itself, and while the courts did step in and end the reign of the bigger cinema studios, today's major players seem to be acting with more caution, rowing their empires while they cover their backs. The studios lost their might by having their cinema chains pried away from them. That's a solution that just doesn't seem plausible today. Is there anything you or I can do as an individual to enact some kind of affirmative change to bring gaming back to a place that's not so insidious and scary? I'm gonna say, again, probably not. So what do we do? Well, whilst there's not a whole lot any one individual can do, a collective change in mindset can enact progress. For years, gamers have played into a sense of tribalism. Xbox versus PlayStation, console versus PC, casual versus hardcore. But that very tribalism is at the benefit of the gaming oligopolies. They are dividing up demographics and are content knowing their fan base will stick with them. But we shouldn't. We as the consumers should have the power. If the provider jacks up prices or makes a blunder, we shouldn't excuse but cease support. Facilitate competitive products, competitive prices and a competitive market. Don't excuse negligence or poor games or unfair business practices. And if a company you've given your hard-earned money to year on year decides to pull the rug out from under you, don't give them the benefit of the doubt. Get angry. The industry is running amok 
You can either lay down and let it happen, or you can thrash out and see what happens. Progress could occur if enough of their customers just stop paying for thinly veiled cash grabs and poorly made games. That could be the first ripple that causes a wave. The industry may well be too far gone. We may already be in the throes of hypercapitalism, and the gaming empires that have risen to the top may keep their reign indefinitely. But then again, bigger industries have crumbled. We'll just have to wait and see whether this demise comes from the courts, their greed, or their own fans.